Ireland has always had the reputation of being a very religious country, but recently all that's changed. The power of the church here is no more. In its place, new religions are filling the void, ready to exploit vulnerable people looking for that spiritual guidance. So on tonight's show, we expose some of the sinister elements of these religions. Exactly who are the people behind them? Just where do they get their money? And could you be their next target? It's all coming up on Exposed, Ireland's Secret Cults. Off the west coast of Ireland, on the island of Ackle, Christina Gallagher has been operating an organisation called the House of Prayer for almost 20 years. Her followers see her as a holy visionary who claims to speak regularly with the Virgin Mary. So what exactly has Our Lady been telling her? Way back before there was a word for tsunami, I seen the first tsunami. The one world currency, one world bank, one world government, and one world church. You have learned nothing from all the catastrophes throughout the world. The head or our governments would be no more than puppets. To do anything, you'd have to have the chip, which is the mark of the beast. We obtained this footage of Christina, apparently having one of her visions. The packed audience of followers watches on in awe, and why wouldn't they? when apparently her prayers have also cured everything from cancer to multiple sclerosis. But don't take our word for it. This is her spiritual director, Jared McGinnity. He interprets her apocalyptic visions, which threaten doom and destruction if you don't donate. He's also the parish priest in the small village of Knockbridge, County Loud. The most frequently cured condition is cancer. Cancer of virtually every part of the body has been healed. We're meeting a man who used to attend the House of Prayer and has agreed to speak to us anonymously. We'll call him John. He says it has about 5,000 core followers now, and he remembers two visions in particular. One, she said the world was going to end within a couple of years, and it was going to be from a nuclear holocaust. And she said two-thirds of the world would be wiped out, and half of the two-thirds that would be wiped out would be good, and the other half would be bad. And that's the way it was. I heard Father McGinnity as well talking about the earthquake, if you remember, um, in Indonesia, and, uh, which killed thousands and thousands of people in Thailand and Indonesia. And he said that one of the main reasons was because of the paedophile rings in Thailand. The Lord had seen it and was so dismayed at what was going on that he had decided that he would take the matter into his own hands. Christina was a humble housewife when she claimed she had her first vision of Our Lady in 1988, but more soon followed. And in July 1993, the then Archbishop of Toom, Dr. Joseph Cassidy, officially opened the House of Prayer. Back then, the church was fully behind the project. Five years later, following an investigation, the next Archbishop, Dr. Michael Neary, banned the saying of Mass, confessions, and all other sacraments there. In the mid-90s, Christina also claimed to have the stigmata, the crucifixion wounds of Jesus, someone she says she also gets messages from. This footage is part of a Granada program made at the time. But if her supporters see her as a visionary, her opponents say she's a charlatan who has scammed elderly people into donating their life savings to her. The House of Prayer has gone international too over the years, with five branches in the US and even one in Mexico. Meanwhile, the money has poured in. Another person has agreed to speak to us anonymously. Anne used to attend the House of Prayer on Ackle before eventually seeing the light. There are people who will hang on every word that Father McGinnity says, and if it's coming from Our Lady, of course, as the answer was, you've heard it, we must give it. And uh, people mortgage houses, to out equity in houses, to credit union loans, and um, millions and millions of, of, of pounds were raised. Cash was given in envelopes, uh, checks were given, but they felt that they were given it, and that they would the motive was that it was because our lady asked for it and they would be rewarded in some way for that in 1996 christina bought this house in newport county mayo and spent another 300,000 pounds on home improvements father mcginnity got his own room in it too but questions started to be asked where did a woman with no visible means of income get all this money were the donations not to help with our lady's work christina and father mcginnity decided to go on tv to explain 
wealthy. I never was short. My husband was always well able to take care of me and my family. I got a substantial amount of money from a royalty for my book. Many come and they give nothing. There's some come and they may buy a book, buy a few medals. This is the, oh, it's the only chapel or church that I'm aware of with the public coming where there isn't a collection. Who is, it, is the House of Prayer accountable to? Who's accountable for the House of Prayer in, in the, the bottom House line? The House of Prayer has a cheque book and every receipt for everything that's got has to be accounted for to the accountant. Everything that's bought has to go be bought through the cheque book. So there's no one but who can... Who holds the keys and the, and the signatories of the cheque book? Who, who is accountable? Is it you? There's two people involved in being able to sign a cheque for whatever is needed for the house. Um, the same as in any religious yes, order or religious right. house. There's Usually the birth or superior and superior or whatever. Do you mind me asking who those people are? Well, there's me and there's um, the secretary of the house. Christina bought a house close to Ackle with, she says, monies from royalties and her husband's established business. But because of rumours, she is continuously harassed by the press. Once they discovered it was my house because of the big wall, and the big wall really was to keep people out, because I found myself with journalists looking in my bedroom window and writing about what was in my bedroom. And I think if you can really experience what a wall is all about, it's a prison. That programme 13 years ago is the last interview Christina Gallagher has ever given. Clearly she thought that by keeping her head down, people would leave her alone and her plan almost worked. You see, Christina was always rumoured to live in a big house up in Dublin. And in 2008, Sunday World journalist Jim Gallagher found it. It's here in the Abington Estate, in the plush north side suburb of Malahide, and it's worth millions. We decided to pay it a visit. A millionaire pop stars, Ronan Keating lives here, Nikki Byrne from Westlife lives here, but she has the biggest, uh, second biggest house on the estate, bigger than, than these pop stars. It was purchased uh, for 3.5 million in April 2006. By the time we found it, it was worth about 4, 4 million euro. And she'd done a lot of work to it. Um, she, she lived here secretly. Nobody knew she, she, she was here. Um, it's an amazing house. It's a five bedroom, five ensuite bedrooms, five reception rooms, a coach house for three garages. Now, we have to ask ourselves, why does a leader of a religious organisation have to live in such uh, plushness? But do we think, Jim, that her supporters you know, knew nothing about this house until uh, you found it a couple of years ago? No, there's actually no doubt that people didn't know about it. I was bombarded with phone calls and letters and emails afterwards uh, from people who'd given money and who'd been supporting the house, but I couldn't believe uh, the, you know, the luxury in which she lived because she always told people she had no interest in material things. Now. Um, before it was bought, there were secret meetings held around the country where followers were handpicked to attend meetings. Millions of pounds were pledged. One particular meeting outside Mullingar, 1.8 million was pledged. And at the end of that meeting, people were asked to sign their cheques to a John Rooney. So you can imagine my surprise when I dug up the property records of this house to find that it's actually registered in the name of John Rooney. And who is John Rooney, Jim? He was her right-hand man in America. He built the Ohio House of Prayer for her, but he has since left. And one couple who I interviewed a couple of years ago, and they got their checks back from the bank to, to, as proof. Uh, they signed a check to 50,000 euro to John Rooney, and another one to 40,000 to Father McGinnity himself. News that the big house in Dublin had actually been found sent shockwaves through some of the House of Prayer supporters. Father McGinnity even went on live line trying to defend it. There are many people in Dublin who have uh, invited Christina to stay in their place or to occupy a place if she uh, wants to get away from it all or whatever. And uh, it, it, that has happened over the years and there are different houses. So who Dublin, owns number two, Abington? Well, that's, um, I don't want to be giving people's identities away. That wouldn't be proper. But uh, I she, know that she, she, doesn't, she doesn't own it, even though she's photographed in the Sunday World, obviously, buying furnishings for it. No, she wasn't buying furnishes, furnishings for it, necessarily. That was a superimposed picture, which was sleight of hand, like so much else in the article. It's and has anyone ever left money to Christina in their will? Uh, to her personal will, not that I know. Well, to the House of Prayer, sorry. Uh, no, uh, not that I know of now. Have any uh, people donated large amounts of money to the House of Prayer? Um, no, not really. Well, then how do these House of Prayers exist then? Yes, the Houses of Prayer 
uh, would have been helped and financed but by that, that's, well, that's, that's the answer to the question I was asking. Yeah, but it's not to Christina personally, Joe. No, I, I didn't ask personally. I said, has no. money been given to the House of Prayer? Yeah. You said no, and then you said yes. Other houses linked to Christina in the Mayo area soon came to light, including this one worth around €1 million Euro outside Ballina. But if the House of Prayer supporters were shocked at the discovery of the big house in Malahide, they were in for an even bigger surprise. Christina had another luxury home, this time in the UK. Clearly we'd have to get a look at it, but before doing that, there was one more thing to do in Malahide. Time to deliver our letter to Christina Gallagher asking for an interview. Here we go. And then I think we'll try the bell and see if she's inside. Now we've been told that this is her main residence, so there's probably a good chance that she's here, but whether or not she'll come out or not is a different story. There's no cars in the driveway, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything. So she remains as elusive as ever, it seems. Hello? If anyone can hear me, it's Michael Ryan from TV3. I just wanted to leave a letter to Mrs. Gallagher asking for an interview for a programme we're making. She remains a mystery. Coming up, we expose another cult that has torn families apart and we track down Christina Gallagher's secret UK hideaway. It's 11am on a Sunday morning and like thousands around the country, these people are making their way to Mass. But they're not heading to any normal service as they are members of an extreme religion called the Palmarians. And it's here in this quiet residential street in North Dublin that they have their Irish headquarters. A dissident branch of the Catholic Church, they have their own Pope and priests and ascribe to a set of rules that among other things forbids its members from even speaking to other non-Palmerians. Ex-cult members, some who were happy to tell their story and others who were frightened to speak publicly agreed to provide us with documents from the church which exposed just how controlled Irish members are by it and its rules. At home you are obliged to do without television or video or computer and those of you who still have garments, books, photos, holy pictures or anything else against Palmyrian norms destroy them. There is no time to lose. But perhaps the most devastating element of these rules is members were ordered to cut all ties with those who didn't believe, including family members. One ex-member agreed to speak to us on the condition that we didn't reveal her identity. Her story was a frightening one. Beth's mother was 16 years old when she joined the Palmerians. Her own mother was a member. Her father converted to the religion to marry Beth's mother and they went on to have four children. She says their childhood was a happy one, but as they grew into teenagers, the attitude of the church began to change. Simple things like the programs they watched or the books they read were controlled. We came across a load of books. Sure enough, when we flicked through them, there were holes throughout them where she had cut out images. My brother had an engineering book and there were people in it wearing t-shirts or whatever and she'd colour over their arms to make the t-shirt look like a long sleeve top. As the members became more fanatical, Beth's father became more wary and eventually left the cult. The children followed, but Beth's mother remained a member. He actually said to my mother, this church is going to tell you to leave us. And she said, there is no way that's going to happen. And that is exactly what did happen. The boys and my sister tried to abide by the Palomarian rules for her sake. But they were so intense and so strict and it was kind of hard not to listen to your music or play the guitar or watch TV. And eventually it obviously became too much for her. And whether she went to the church or they spoke to her, I'm not sure. But she was told that she had to leave us. My dad said to her, you really need to start thinking for yourself. If you don't want to go, don't go. You can't allow them to make you leave us. I remember he said to her, look, it's Christmas next week. You can't buy a turkey and ham with me if you're not going to be here. And she assured him that she wasn't going to leave. 
So he went off to work. And when he came home, she was gone. At first, the children didn't believe that she was gone for good. She called us the next day, and I can't remember. She may have called on Christmas Day. And I remember my brother, who was 16 at the time, was on the phone to her, and she said, I'm not going to be able to come back. And he kept saying, but why? And she said, I just can't. The Pope won't allow me. And my brother said, so you're not coming home for Christmas? And she said, no. To fully understand this Irish cult, I needed to go to a small town in Spain near the city of Seville to where the Palmarians first began. The country has always had a strong connection to the Catholic Church and religion plays a major role in their lives. So in the late 1960s, when three young girls witnessed an apparition of the Virgin Mary in a field just outside the village of Palmer de Troya, many seers came to pray. Among these people came two Spanish men, Clemente Dominguez y Gomez, an accountant, and Alonso Manuel Corral, a lawyer. Clemente claimed visions, prophecies, and declared himself Pope of his own religion, the Carmelites of the Holy Face, otherwise known as the Palmarians. Many Catholics living in the area fell for his every word. On one occasion, he claimed to lose 15 litres of blood, his own version of the stigmata. The Palmarian headquarters towers above the small village of Palmer de Troya, but is guarded by a high wall and security. Concerned by the potential reaction of the Palmarians to our investigation, I met with English journalist Wendy Williams away from the Basilica, where I knew I couldn't be seen. The rules since 2005 have been incredibly strict that they can't talk to anyone that isn't dressed exactly the same way that their rules dictate. So there is no interaction. They wouldn't even look at you or answer you if you talked to them in the street. There is like, you could walk past them and there wouldn't be any acknowledgement. It's very private. The one feeling you really get here is that it's all quite remote. It's a very small village. They're up on a hill by themselves. There's a five foot wall all around it. It's actually quite sinister. The Pope has taken over just last month. No one knows very much about him, but he has a military background and there's a massive fear that it is going to get even stricter. And if you look at the rhetoric from the last few years, the language they're using is really calling, calling you to arms, calling for a war, let go of your lukewarmness and move towards it and die if necessary for it. And people are scared of that. Eager to get a glimpse of the inside of the basilica, my colleague and I approached the front gates to be met by security. We were dressed in full Palmarian gear. We pretended to be followers from Ireland who wanted to attend a service. I was refused access, although no reason was given. My colleague was not. The photos that emerged showed a devoted, if somewhat strange, religion. We knew we needed to find out more. Since her secret Dublin mansion was found, Christina Gallagher has been firefighting to keep her House of Prayer organisation out of the media spotlight. But the latest big controversy was the discovery of another luxury home linked to her, this time in the UK. We've come to the small village of Knocken in Shropshire near the Welsh border. It's a pretty unremarkable, quaint little place with not much happening. The houses look fairly ordinary too, apart from one. Anyway, we're coming up, just coming up to the road now. Um, this, this driveway heads straight down to the big house right at the end, and that's wow. there right in front of you. That's it at the end? That's it. Some, some amazing place. That is impressive. The house was found in the last few months by Sunday World journalist Jim Gallagher after being put up for sale before the summer. It's called Lower Hall and was bought with cash for £1.8 million sterling in 2009. It's now on the market for a cool two and a quarter million pounds and is in Christina's son's name. Oh, it's, a, it's an amazing house. Um, you can actually watch it on the, um, on the, on the state agent's uh, website. It's, uh, it's set in five acres. It's 11,500 uh, square foot in the house. Um, it has its own lake. It has an indoor swimming pool. It has seven bedrooms, uh, seven bathrooms. 
a hot tub for seven uh, people. There's a gym, there's a steam room, uh, there's a snooker room. Um, you know, the kitchen is laid out in um, Italian marble. She always claims to her followers that uh, material wealth means nothing to her and she would happily live in a tent. Uh, well, obviously, when you see a place like this and the home she also owns in Ireland, it's utter nonsense. Keen to avoid another controversy like she had with the house in Malahide, Christina made her followers sign a legal document before donating to this particular cause. Her website quotes the document which says they were making a donation directly to and for the personal benefit of Christina Gallagher and that it couldn't be reclaimed at any time. She doesn't have a job as such, Jim, does she? No, she doesn't. She hasn't worked for, for years. She's, she's, this, you know, she just, um, she's a full-time visionary, as it were. You know, there's no, no income. But, I mean, we have to question where does the money come from, from, from these homes. I mean, there was a time in, um, she wouldn't, there was a manager that was in the House of Prayer in Ackle, which she runs. Um, he only lasted five weeks because she refused to let him open the mail. She, she insisted it was her, her only pleasure. She's been left uh, properties in wills, from what we've been told. There's this one couple who went public with me three years ago. They'd given 150,000 uh, euros over a 10-year spell. And a friend of theirs, a colleague of theirs, had given 100,000. Uh, when I started doing my stories in the Sunday world, they, they sued to get their, their money back, and she paid back the 250000 to those three within four weeks. Well, there is a car in the driveway of the house, and there is a light on in the upstairs window. Um, do you fancy ringing another intercom now? I think uh, we'll give it a bash, but I'd be very surprised if she is here, because well, she spends very little time it's here. It's worth a shot. Yeah, yeah. Let's go. But just like the house in Malahide, no one came out. In the past, the House of Prayer has been accused of selling even bricks and bits of old carpet from the building in Ackle. But its latest attempt to raise funds centres around this framed picture of Our Lady. It's on sale for €250 Euro in the gift shop. And if you buy it, it'll give you protection. For people like Anne, it represents the final straw. And we went into the shop and we questioned them about it and I said if I buy the postcard. Um, so that's the same picture. They said no, it had to be the one for 250 euros that would provide protection against the impending calamities. And I said, sure, this is heretical. I rang uh, the Archbishop in an awful state and said, please, I, I spoke to his secretary. I said, I have to tell the Archbishop, does he realize what's going on in the House of Prayer? And he said, well, we, we know all about it, and there are five large files of complaints in Archbishop Neary's office. And we have had, you know, hundreds of phone calls like yours. And subsequently, my research told me that she was operating at a loss. And uh, then now she's operating with two million profits. And that's directly as a result of that picture and it's being boxed and shipped to the States. Coming up, a former Irish member breaks the Church of Scientology's code of silence, and we go undercover at the House of Prayer. On Dublin's Abbey Street, you'll find the Irish headquarters of Scientology, the most talked about cult in the world. Suppressive people, that kind of thing. I mean, you don't allow criticism. Oh no, a suppressive person isn't critical. A suppressive person is a person who denies the right of others. Meet its creator, speculative fiction writer L. Ron Hubbard. In the 50s, he published a self-help book, Dianetics, and it became the Bible of his new religion. Through a type of counselling they called auditing, practitioners aim to consciously re-experience painful or traumatic events in their past in order to free themselves of their limiting effects. Its followers credit the religion with changing their lives. Even if it's as small as one person. It really jumped my grades from being, you know, B plus, A minus to solid A's. And they are not the only ones. Being a Scientologist, when you drive past an accident, it's not like anyone else. As you drive past, you know you have to do something about it because you know you're the only one that can really help. Along with Kirstie Alley, John Travolta and Juliette Lewis, Scientology has a huge celebrity following. 
The religion offers its members a wide range of life improvement courses that charge anything from 50 euro to thousands of euro. But the religion's methods of self-analysis have been criticised and the organisation has drawn accusations of cultism. It was time to investigate if these accusations were fair. Where's the cult? Where's the cult? Where's the cult? Where's the cult? On Dublin's Abbey Street every month, a group calling themselves Anonymous gather outside the Scientology headquarters to protest. The group is made up of ex-members, those with family members involved, and those who simply believe that this group is a fake. One of its most prolific protesters is Matthew McKenna. Matthew, you weren't even a member of the Church of Scientology. Why the interest? I think when you look at the impact that different groups can actually have on people, in terms of sort of ruin people financially, mentally, and by breaking their social circle, Scientology goes far beyond any other group that I'm aware of. So just who is behind the masks? Behind one is Gabby Wynne, who until last year not only followed but worked for the church. She was just 19 when she became a member of the organisation. Through a personality test, workers in the Church of Scientology building in Dublin discovered that Gabby's father had been a heavy drinker and they advised her to take part in some Scientology courses, which they said would help her deal with the stress of this. They say they have the answer to everything, like no matter what your problem is, they have an answer to it, kind of. Like one of the first questions was, how much do you earn? And they kind of started pressuring me into taking out loans then, like it started off with 2,000 euro and then they wanted me to top up a loan and then up to 5,000 euro. I was getting calls on my phone all day saying, so when are you going to the bank? When are you going to the bank? This focus on spending money on courses is echoed by fellow ex-member Pete Griffins. He says he lost 20 years of his life to Scientology. The whole of Scientology is set up like a, it's like a ladder with courses at every level that you have to pay for and do. Um, they do say that you're allowed to walk away after doing one or two courses. You're not. They want you to do the next one and the next one and the next one until you're half a million quid worse off. Through the company's office, I find documents showing that the Irish branch, which claims to have sold 100,000 Scientology-related goods, filed accounts recently showing a deficit of nearly 700,000 euro. But thankfully, the money in the international organisation is phenomenal and it can support the Irish branch. Tax filings from the early 1990s in the US show that the church was earning about $300 million a year back then, but the paper trail disappears after that. Celebrities like Tom Cruise, however, are thought to have donated around $25 million, and over 160 countries have branches, so the organisation doesn't appear to have a cash flow problem. It wasn't long before I got a phone call from Matthew McKenna asking me to meet him. He said he had in his possession some private Church of Scientology documents which would prove the organisation's primary focus is to sell courses and Scientology goods. Now one of the main things that I've noticed in Scientology is this pressure to recruit people all of the time and we have here a document and this is called How to Sign Up and Start a New Person Drill. Can you bring me through this? If they can get you to believe that you have a problem and get you to believe that, then you're, it's easier to sell you a course to fix that problem. And this is what these questions are all about. They're very leading. They're trying to get people to divulge information which then can be used to sort of get that person to feel bad. And when they get a person to feel badly enough, then it becomes very easy to sell them a course on how to fix it. And that's what it's all about. does state here the end phenomena, which is obviously the goal or the objective, a staff member who can competently sign up and start a new person on a paid service and sell books. So it's somebody who can spend money. Paying for courses is a huge aspect of Scientology. They appear to involve training of some sort. Part of the communication course caught my eye. The way this sort of works is you actually sort of are sitting down with usually an ashtray as your prop and you're sitting down in one chair and the ashtray is sitting down on the other tray. And what you do is you would yell at the ashtray, stand up, and you'd actually lift the ashtray, hold it up in the air, and then say thank you, and you'd carry that again and again and again. And that, by doing that, you're supposed to be learning how to get your commands carried out. If you've drilled the same action again and again and again and again, and if you are in everyday life and you encounter someone who's, what do you call it, not quite of the same viewpoint as you, you will actually start, you know, these train routines, they will kick in, you'll remember all the training you've done and you'll just go into that zone, you'll just focus entirely on getting your command carried out. 
In another document, the group outlines how members must deal with people who don't support Scientology. They are called suppressive people. It appears to state that those people must be cut out of a Scientologist's life. If it was practised, it would cut families apart. At the protest, Anne Robinson approached me. We believe we've been de declared suppressive persons by that organisation because of the fact that we have spoken publicly about our concerns about the organisation and the damage that it has done to our family and other families. The reason she is speaking out is that her brother Tony is a member of the church and hasn't spoken to Anne or any of their family in 10 years. In fact, they have no idea where in the world he is. Did Tony change when he became a member of the Church of Scientology? Yeah, completely. Like, it seemed almost like a lot of his answers to questions we'd ask were rehearsed, things that he would have, we believe, learned in courses on how to handle his family. The expression on his face, the lack of emotion. It was, he was like a different person. What effect, Anne, has the Church of Scientology and Tony's membership of it had on your family? It's been totally devastating in terms of Grief. I said he hasn't died, but we haven't seen him in 10 years. My dad died at the age of 86 in 2002, and he hadn't seen Tony for a number of years before that. And that really broke him. You're taught that what Ron Hubbard wrote is the only way forward for mankind. He had all the answers to all man's problems. When you look at the evidence, you find out, no, he didn't. Because, you know, th there's no evidence to prove that any of that happened. I mean, it's just not there. But when you're involved, you're very insular and you're very isolated. You're not allowed to read books, you're not allowed to watch TV, read newspapers. They have control over you. And it's one of the aspects of a cult that they will try and control your thoughts, your emotions, your behaviour and your information. And Scientology tries to control all of those things. After checking out Christina Gallagher's luxury houses, it was now time to take a closer look inside the mother house of the House of Prayer on Ackle Island. We got a tip off that Christina herself might be present at one of the big celebration days there. If she was, that'd be rare. Apparently she doesn't bother showing up much. No cameras are allowed on the complex, so we took along a hidden camera instead. The chapel was full, so much so that they had to seat people outside. There were coaches from all over the country. Inside, through a busy gift shop and cafe, we found about another 100 people listening to events in the chapel on a big screen. Father McGinnity addressed the crowd, reminding them of Christina's healing power. I refer in mentioning the 700 or so healings, the cures of virtually every form of cancer, leukemia, people who are brain dead, and then rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, conditions that cannot be healed scientifically, <clears throat> medically, nor, of course, psychologically. Christina herself did appear, but it was brief. Father McGinnity told us she'd be uniting with us in prayer from another room. Meanwhile, outside, we got talking to a house of prayer steward. <laughs> Later we were approached by this man who's high up in the house of prayer. He was also keen to tell us about the 250 euro picture that would protect us from future disasters. That picture, if you have that in your house, and you pray it before the rosary before it, uh, you see the way, that, I don't know what he's noticed or not, all the disasters and everything is coming, mm -hmm. no country's going to escape. If you say the consecration prayer each day, that will protect you from suicide. And there's all sorts of stories about, there's some big house in the UK or something, is that No, 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 no let's, let's be very clear about this now, right? Our Lady asked for things to be done, and 
Christina gave the message to the people and it's up to the people to respond and there was a message about because she was getting so hounded by the media that her lady said to get money together to get her, uh, to, for her to go away and buy somewhere private to get away but they were saying she was living in a mansion look she couldn't go live in a bungalow on the side of the road and our Lord did guide her to the house of Manahide and the people did put money together for her to buy the house in England she only lives in two rooms in the house don't focus on that look at go in and read the test Testimonies. Talk to people here of being cured. Does Christina ever come in? I'm sorry, do any people are? Uh, she used to, but I, I don't think she is today. She's not feeling well at all. The Chinese are going to pay it all the way into your own. Chinese? Chinese. That's what's going on. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry, I, I don't want to. It seems so, str so bizarre, uh, a thought. Yes, isn't it? But they have the manpower. When we finally got into the chapel, the elusive Christina was nowhere to be seen. She disappeared into a door at the back with a key code on it. The first time we'd ever seen a chapel with key code doors. We joined a queue to see a statue of Our Lady in a glass case, apparently weeping. But if she was, we couldn't see it. Our camera did catch Father McGinnity being warmly greeted. Coming up, why the Palmarians would die for their church, and we pay Father McGinnity a visit. Just like the Scientologists, the Palmarians had given us evidence that cults at their most extreme can tear families apart. For Beth, who had been a Palmarian, it's been six years since she or any of her siblings have spoken with their mother. I definitely feel that she was brainwashed. I feel I was as well. To get to the point where you're reluctant to question things, that's not good. If it's really true, why can't I question it? Why are you trying to hide? She believes her mother has given thousands of euro to the organisation and that she now lives within the Basilica in Spain. One day we were in a supermarket and she was there and my dad went over to try and talk to her and she just completely ignored him. He was telling me that she reached up to try and get something off the shelf but she couldn't reach. So he got it and gave it to her and said, can you not just talk to me? And she said, I'm sorry, I don't know who you are, and if you don't leave me alone, I'm going to have to call the police. Just like the House of Prayer, the Palmerians survive on donations from their members. How much each member donates is kept a closely guarded secret, but in the course of our investigation, I found a will of an ex-member. In it, she had left the church 20,000 euro. Her family claims she was terrorised by the organisation into doing this. What all ex-members fear is that those who remain within the cult in Ireland, thought to be around 300 people, will take up the call of arms that journalist Wendy Williams talked about and indeed preachings from the church refer heavily to that. Beloved faithful, in the times we are living in, Depravity, depravity is all about us. It is possible that we will die in the struggle, but to die for Christ is triumph. This is the inside of the Irish church where cult members meet for prayers and mass. And this is the face of their leader, a Father Gerontimus. When I approached their church in Dublin to ask them about their religion, their rules, their beliefs and their impact on innocent families, they refused to even answer the door. Letters and phone calls prompted the same reaction. What attracts someone to this cult is unknown. What is known, however, is that if the fears of ex-members come to pass, membership could prove fatal. Many ex-followers of Christina Gallagher blame her spiritual director, Father McGinnity, for making the House of Prayer credible. One of the reasons many followers respect him so much is that in the 1980s he blew the whistle on an abuse scandal in St. Patrick's College, Maynooth, and was effectively demoted. Father McGinnity is parish priest here in the tiny village of Knockbridge, County Louth. We decided to pay him a visit. So we waited outside the church following Mass one morning, but he was tipped off and left by a different exit. We then called to his house to see if he talked to us, but there was no answer, so we left another letter. 
As we tried to film another interview nearby, we realized we were being watched by people who kept driving past us. There goes your man. There he is now. Two weeks after our visit, we got two solicitor's letters from people in the House of Prayer and the Parish Council. They wanted to remind us of their privacy rights and accused us of harassment. Mike Gard is a so-called cult expert who runs the Dialogue Ireland website. Is it fair to say, Mike, that without Father McGinnity, you know, there wouldn't be a House of Prayer, or at least a House of Prayer that's as successful as it is at the minute? I think that going back to the history, she started off as a minor fortune teller. I think that she saw in Sligo kind of moving statues, and I think she began to see that she could sell this as a product. She basically used Mary to sell this product, and she found someone who was interested in visions and has been a, known for years as someone who supports this type of stuff. And without him, she would be a minor piece of footnote in some events that took place in the 80s. We obtained this footage of Father McGinnity saying Mass. It's very curious, to say the least. Let it become for us the body and blood of Jesus Christ, your only Son, our Lord. Uh, the day before he suffered. He calls these epileptic type seizures darts of love by the Holy Spirit. He took bread in his sacred hands and looking up to heaven. Among ex-members, there's a growing anger with Cardinal Sean Brady, who's the head of the Catholic Church in Ireland. A group of them met him in 2008, but say he's failed to deal with Father McGinnity, despite calling him in for talks. We wrote to the Cardinal looking for an interview. His office replied, turning down our request, and saying that Father McGinnity has assured Cardinal Brady he has nothing to do with fundraising for the House of Prayer. But Mike Gard thinks there's another reason why the Cardinal won't act further. Next year, the Irish hierarchy is hoping to re-energize the Catholic Church by having a Eucharistic Congress in Dublin. And they are planning and they're hoping that possibly uh, Pope Benedict might in fact come here. So there's no way that he's going to deal with this issue. This is a minor issue in, in his global plans. After visiting the House of Prayer on Ackle with a hidden camera, it was now time to make an official visit. Our plan today is basically to drive up to the House of Prayer and deliver this letter which I've written to Christina Gallagher, basically inviting her to take part in the program. Now it's very unlikely, I have to admit, that she is going to agree to an interview because she hasn't done an interview in years. So it's unlikely that that's about to change anytime soon, we feel, but we can only try. Try the doorbell again. Hello, could I have a quick word with someone, please? No, nobody coming out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to post my letter in the door. OK, well, as you saw, I went up to the door, rang the bell a couple of times, um, shouted in the letterbox, and they're not coming out to speak to me. Although, as you can probably see there, or I don't know if you can see or not, there is still, uh, the door is opening and closing at this stage. So there's somebody there looking outside the door, and they can obviously see that I'm here and they don't want to speak to me at all. Um, so I shouted in the letterbox and uh, still no joy. There's some more people there trying to get in at the minute, but um, I'd say they're probably waiting for, uh, for us to go before they open the door for them. So definitely people there, but they're not coming out to talk to us. So what now for the House of Prayer? The Revenue Commissioners took the House of Prayer's charitable status away in 2006, meaning all donations are liable for tax. The Gardaí have also investigated in the past, but say they're reliant on more victims to make a formal complaint. As for the church authorities, they continue to say the House of Prayer has no approval, but it seems they're unwilling to do anything else about it. On tonight's programme, we've exposed Ireland's secret cults and shown the devastating impact they have on people's lives. Families are torn apart, victims are left feeling ashamed, and in the end, it's all about money. With all the recent scandals involving the church in Ireland, we could see more and more vulnerable people looking elsewhere for spiritual guidance. And unfortunately, it seems there will always be someone only too happy to provide it.
TV3 have been in ongoing discussions with the House of Prayer and hope to be able to broadcast their views on the matters raised on tonight's programme in the near future.